very good evening to one and all present here. I welcome you all to our today's session of Varta Lab for teacher educators and teachers, NEP 2020 and re-envisioning re teacher education. Our topic for today is teaching of social sciences. What kind of citizens? Uh, NEP 2020 vision. Our guest for today is Ms. Simantini Duru. Let me first introduce to you our speaker for today. Simantini Dhuru is the director of Avehi Abacus Project, a unique educational initiative that works with all the municipal schools in Mumbai. She has been involved in various human rights and environmental movements as a media activist since 1986. She has made several documentary films which have won both national and international acclaim. She has made key contribution to several national and state policy making bodies. She is also a visiting faculty at the Tata Institute of Social Sciences, Mumbai. Ma'am, we welcome you for our today's session. The session is all yours. Ma so thank you everyone. And uh, thank you, uh, Gomati Niharika for having me here. Uh, we will try to uh, keep some time, enough time, at least 20 minutes for interaction. Uh, so as you know that we are looking at um, the teaching of social sciences and uh, particularly with, uh, you know, an understanding of what the national education policy 2020 uh, has to offer in terms of its uh, conception of social sciences. Uh, the role that it has uh, or has not placed um, on the shoulders of social sciences uh, per se. Uh, so uh, before we, uh, I'll, I'll start sharing the screen with the slideshow and it will be nice if in case there is any, um, uh, any pertinent kind of an issue and you would like to raise hand and uh, take it for discussion. Otherwise we will keep everything together after the presentation. So um, as you can see, the question that we are raising for ourselves is the role of the citizen uh, and the, the conception of citizenship in social sciences in uh, the national education policy 2020. So one question that we firstly begin to ask ourselves is why is it that we have social sciences in schools at all? The answers are here, but would any of you like to contribute more or at least you know, take up this last point, which is here, whether one way we look at the teaching of social sciences that we hope to cultivate scientific thinking to approach uh, social society, social uh, issues, and to understand social phenomena in scientific way and to engage both in terms of explaining uh, the workings of society and uh, also in, in the tradition uh, of you know, enlightenment uh, from where the beginning of science uh, as we have in modern societies uh, to also intervene and make life better. And so from there, one goes to the second point, social scientific thinking, not only to explain, understand social phenomena, the workings of society, but also with the hope to make society a better place. And in modern world, since last 150, 200 years of human history, that collective imagination of what a good society is in terms of the evolution of the modern state, because before that you didn't have a modern state as an institution, which was a democratic, demo, democratically functioning institution. And so um, it is essential as it's conceived to have a certain kind of upbringing of the young to understand the value of democracy, to engage in democratic functioning. And 
it is assumed that this kind of a thing needs needs enculturation needs preparation needs education and this is where the role of social sciences or social sciences are given that responsibility but we need to ask ourselves the question whether these two these two points whether you know thinking about the social phenomena in a scientific manner and preparing citizens citizens future citizens to engage in um, democracy democratic uh, uh, functioning of a state are they two really mutually in, in, in exclusive or are they actually part of the same uh, aspect and so social sciences really are very directly uh, given that responsibility of preparing the adolescents for their role as citizens and so more than any other subject they are directly engaged in shaping students into very very distinct kind of individuals with support of an epistemological framework um social sciences then before because of this uh, hope to instill in students certain kind of attributes attitudes skills knowledge ideals and shape them into quote and quote good citizens and so we need to then ask ourselves what is it that we understand by when we need good good citizens and what does really citizenship itself mean is it there i mean we need to also understand whether there is only one kind of understanding of citizenship uh that is the main question that comes and when we try to ask ourselves this question what kind of citizen what kind of citizen to function in a democratic polity the next thing that we need to then ask ourselves as to what kind of democracy are we and what kind of democracy do we inspire to be this is necessary because um there are the understanding of democracy itself is not something which is common to all it is a contested concept whether we and we need to recognize this as a concept that not only has different dimensions but that it has different kinds of polarizing viewpoints often and if that is so then there are implications to that because if we choose to understand democracy in a certain way then we thus also choose to educate our children for that kind of conception of democracy and as we know that it's social sciences that play have the mantle of doing that and so they have that role of creating citizens for future and so because the conceptions of democracy democratic society is not something that is commonly understood by all in the same way the education for citizenship or understanding about citizenship itself is also is a contested concept but but we know that um, democracy i mean this is something that we do not dispute that democracy by itself is seen as a desirable ideal um the types of governance is one thing those are something that we teach the children not talking about the types of governance which is uh, you know presidential type of governance or sorry or uh, you know the kind of um, uh, the kind of pattern that we have in our country a uh, three way kind of a three arms of democracy uh we are basically talking about the fundamentals of the concept itself and so when we look at the issue of social sciences and education and preparing certain kinds of good citizens the expectation about the kind of society we are are they fall into a kind of a large spectrum um and they reflect in the policies and programs right from the uh constitution to the kind of 
uh, you know, the laws that we have, not laws only about children and about children's education, but about the right of a citizen also. And uh, the, you know, the role the citizen is envisaged to play in this, uh, the workings of democracy, and how then they are reflect, how they are then uh, filter down to the curriculum framework, the syllabus, the textbook that we used, how we then support and prepare the teachers, how the assessment is expected to be. So everything that goes in, it has that vision, the larger vision that is there in the mind of the planners or larger society as it accepts of a kind of society, a kind of democratic polity. And this is something which is very key to understand because the kind of programs, policies that the country chooses and people endorse or oppose represent a very crucial kind of political choices that affect people's lives and the, the, kind, of, the kind of future the country is meant to have. It has political consequences. And so we need to understand what the arguments in favor of or against these are. So there are these different perspectives on uh, citizenship. Um, and they are, I, I'll sh I'm going to share with you some of these ideas about what kind of conceptions of democracy are there. So one of the things that Walter Parker uh, argues is that one is a kind of, there are three kinds of uh, uh, models that he argues for. One is, as you can see, there is this traditionalist kind of a model and thereby the education that a traditionalist model of democracy proposes essentially basically gives information about the workings of polity, democratic mm. polity, how elections are, how the systems are, how elections are held, how, um, uh, uh, you know, how, how laws are uh, made, uh, and also um, ideas about what core democratic values are. A strong model of democracy on the other hand, which is kind of a progressive democracy, which a country would aspire to, has greater emphasis. And those are again reflected in the educational policies and programs on civic participation, not simply knowing what happens, but to know how to participate in the process to make it happen. So this is something envisaged as preparing children to engage in critically understanding the processes that are necessary for, uh, for, for changing or making character of democratic polity. And so here, children are expected to ask questions and intervene, participate. Further to that is, as Parker says, is an advanced model of democracy. Here, it's not only to participate to make things happen, but also question fundamentally what is given. You know, who is at the helm of thing? Why are certain groups more dominant than the other? What are those histories that has made that dominance possible? or the subjugation possible? Is there a possibility of change? And so it is not only the participation to make things better, uh, but to also fundamentally structurally analyze the way society is in terms of its histor historical development, in terms of its current positioning, okay? So this is the advanced kind of democracy model that Parker suggests. I've also put down here, just as a contrast to these, is also mm. something that one is often uh, aware of, and that is a conservative model. And I suppose one wouldn't want to really go into the details of what is meant here. That is expected to be create good citizens, good citizens who actually should basically do what is told. 
and understanding that things are there on an individual level if i am good things will be good so i should not litter around i should not throw kachra i should not engage in corruption i am the one who is responsible for my society to be responsible while this is not something that is uh, untrue uh, one uh, cannot stop at that and the conservative model of citizenship essentially would concentrate on this kind of a nature of character creation uh at the same time while i am expanding on these uh, i must uh, put down a rider that none of these models that i am sharing here neither the people who have kind of proposed these and elucidated in this nor do i am proposing that they are mutually exclusive they flow into each other they change over the time and uh, they are often you know a uh, mixed bag in that sense um there are other two very um, uh, you know detailed kind of a description that we have in two other models by um, eh car eh car gives us uh, two models one is the mor moral model of democracy you can see the slide that i show of parker and what i will now now i'm sharing of what uh, car proposes is the model model of democracy one of them uh, you can see for yourself sorry one second and the key features of it is that democracy essentially is something which is not a product it is a process and it is a process whereby citizens actually should engage in political decision making ask questions and um, engage in the process of making decisions and so this is to be done why why because democracy is seen as an ideal it is something desirable for it to be desirable it has that kind of a tone of something which is positive and this comes from various social contract theories which tell us that you know we are basically people right from aristotle that people human beings are people who are not passive we are social people we are social animals and we are political animals and so it's within us and within our interest to engage in the affairs of society to understand society so please do remember that first slide also you know social sciences as teaching of social science is as a scientific discipline inquiry into society from scientific modes positivist modes and second thing is creation of citizenship of for a democratic uh, polity so you can see those threads continuing in all these uh, ideas that are there i don't want to read each and everything i think the time that i'm giving you can sufficiently look at this so basically the social kind of you know the requirements for having this and particularly in uh, in a uh, 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 education system is that children from their young age as they are in school they have the habit of informing themselves they are not passive they are not, they are seekers of knowledge information insights into what is happening in the society around so they are not the ones who are either being told how things work nor are they the ones who are uh, you know told that it's their character that needs to be uh, corrected then when that is fine everything should be all right so uh, the la between the last slide and this you can see the correlation the you know the Uh, progressive and the advance those are the kind of things that come closer somewhere to the model model of democracy car further gives us the other model which is the market model of democracy and here again i mean this is not so easy as it seems all these arguments have developed historically 
historically in context of you know democracies that have had the uh, wherewithal to exist as functioning democracies say at least 100 years before ours for example and so these arguments which are there in the western world have also kind of transformed themselves in one way or the other in other societies uh, and even now so here right from the beginning there is an argument that right from the age of mercantilism colonialism the spread of colonialism in the world across uh, the countries that actually helmed the processes of colonialism have felt the advantages of mercantilism as against the earlier pattern of feudalism and so market is seen as something valued individual private property is seen as something valued and so democracy is seen as that system that allows the functioning of a market in a reasonable way and allows the individual choice also the balance between the individual choice and the uh, you know the functioning of a certain kind of a market economy where things are undisrupted for everybody and so it is kind of seen as a system which is in that sense utilitarian it's in the modern model of democracy it's essential as a trait of human society to function together to argue to contest to ask questions in the earlier set in this set you see it is a kind of a tool an instrument really to have individual liberty individual liberty not the way we define in terms of our constitution alone but individual liberty also to make choices that are economic choices and economic choices and political or social choices are very much part of the same thing and so there is no value per se attached to this kind of a model of democracy it is something that is seen as an essential condition for well being of society in terms of coexisting together for the market as well as for the people and the core of it is not the collective uh, it is the individual there is a, a study about 2 3 years study uh, that um, two other social scientists education educationists did uh, in the us and uh, they by studying different kind of programs that were implemented in different schools in america in uh, teaching social studies the subject which is a kind of a, 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 a com combination of social sciences in that sense but with more uh, stress on um, with more stress on, stress on doing rather than merely knowing and that again is not done something in a uniform way across the different uh, states and so the different programs that they study they came up with this model of uh, you know three kinds of citizen personally responsible participatory and justice oriented and so you can see again you know the similarity with the very first the second slide rather that i had uh, shared the personally responsible one is like the more of a conservative conservative kind of a uh, uh, imagination that there is responsibility there is contribution there is duty to be observed the rules to be obeyed and so there are some of the examples that are there so you do good to society and society will be good and so you are following the patterns set by laws not by critiquing laws participating in making laws as against that you see the participatory citizen and that is the citizen which engages in 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 society in again the you know the progressive model of democracy and so there is more agency to the way the programs for children were they were actually meant to find out data they were actually meant to analyze data do interviews compare different kinds of groups the way they make decisions and based on uh, based on that scientific 
uh, kind of a uh, engagement with uh, whatever problems they chose to do they were meant to then suggest ways to improve a problem okay so your social sciences in that sense the the you know the where with all both the content as well as the skills that are there and the disposition for social sciences is very consciously kind of honed in a program that they classified as participatory citizenship program the third one one would say which then would uh, you know remind you of that third uh, choice that was there in uh, walter parker's model and which is the advance where the justice oriented citizenship programs that some of the schools uh, engaged in were not only uh, you know not only uh, uh, doing things in terms of uh, actually contributing to uh, uh, solving certain social problems but also were uh, looking at why those problems arose at all in the first place and so where are those interest groups that are uh, you know are um, uh, satisfied by keeping the status quo where are those people that are always on the receiving end and where are the traction points uh, the leverages that can uh, change the situation so again here the tools of social sciences are used very consciously and uh, also at the same time the criti critical part the critical uh, aspect of social sciences those are given more exam more more important not simply the issue of you know technocratic kind of a preparation of uh, young adults to to uh, give solutions not as not to become consultants but uh, you know to in a simplest way to become engaging uh, you know uh, activist it could be activist it could be you know political thinkers it could be political uh, uh, representatives it could be lawyers it could be many different things uh, in terms of the professions if one envisages yeah so having looked at some of these ideas that are present in the way citizenship is conceived and education for citizenship is conceived i also want to share with you before we go to nep now is that by itself citizenship some of the people like you know the classical definition of political you know citizenship education in that sense or what is citizenship that is offered by the uh, 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 political theorist th marsh marshall from where one kind of gets this idea is that citizenship as i had said earlier is that is not something that is conceptually a given as a common thing and it's a historically evolving thing but one thing that is different here right now we need to recognize is that marshall feels that it is historically and sequentially evolved uh, concept over last uh, 250 years 300 years or so and that is to be seen in terms of the civil political and social rights that most of the countries in societies today aspire to or have and so one of the things that kind of set it in motion in terms of uh, i mean when you go to the ideas of uh, enlightenment uh, and uh, you know the processes the historical events of say american revolution the french revolution it was or even in our place the bhakti movement for example uh here people conceived themselves in terms of dealing with those in the power as uh people who ought to be equal in society and uh, so freedom to own property which was something that was not allowed for everyone in our country it wasn't allowed for much of a longer time in fact and so it is basically looking at you know set of legal rights okay the second phase that marshall argues is that once you had that kind of a power to have that economic uh, you know economic uh, uh, standing or economic uh, leverage people move to aspire to the next stage and that is to decide as to who is to be 
the representative from me. And so the right, right to vote or right to universal suffrage, that is what was fought for, which began in the European uh, uh, world's world in the, from the late uh, 19th century until the end of the age of colonialism in our countries that uh, Africa, uh, Latin America, uh, Asia continued, that struggle continued till the 20th century. And then after the end of the Second World War, particularly after the, uh, you know, the coming in of the US, the formation of the UN, uh, you had uh, a kind of an understanding that in order to have uh, rights, you also need to have an agency, the agency of modern state, not only as an arbitrator of economic interests of the market, but agency of the state in actually securing welfare of the state, welfare of the people. Because people, if you're representing the people, you also need to ensure that their basic fundamental rights across the world are then uh, you know, meant. And so things like healthcare, education, uh, those uh, uh, sanitation, food, I mean, the list is endless. So these are seen, seen to be essential to the conception really of what uh, democracy is. And so we come to the question now <laughs> is that out of the programs that we saw earlier and the kind of trajectory of change about understanding of citizenship that we have seen, what is it that we choose? What are the programs that have the potential to develop better citizens? And that, of course, something that we will discuss after the presentation and look after looking at the NEP 20. Because it depends on, we know that it depends on many factors, many political views, and it's a continuing kind of a debate. Uh, so there are, you know, seemingly right answers, but sometimes those answers also are not sufficient. It's a poss it's a possible, it is possible to achieve even better answers. And that's because society is not a static thing. That's why, what is it that we do? We need to consider the value orientation of those who design and those who study citizenship education, or in our case, really, those who form policy programs, those who have the power to form curriculum, syllabus, textbooks. But while we saw that there were different models and different kind of conceptions of democracy, conceptions of citizenship education, conception of social sciences itself. We need to know that uh, just because there are these kind of contestations, it doesn't mean that it's a problem. Because if one feels that democracy is worth having, you need to clarify your ideas about what it means and then look at education, look at the role social sciences play in that and engage in it because the stakes are too high because it's essential. It's essential for society, for us as democratic citizens to do this exercise. With this in mind, we are now going to look at what the NAP 2020 does. I'm sharing with you the vision of the policy. The vision of the policy, it is, see, first of all, it is very difficult to have any focus statement or concluding statement to critique, appreciate, or you know, comment on in this policy document about social sciences, how their role is envisaged, because there is no clear statement about exactly what social sciences are and what they are meant to do. Uh, one can understand in a larger education policy, it is not easy to elaborate on this. But if you studied earlier policy documents or policy documents with you know, this kind of a significance that is meant to shape the uh, way education system and thereby the society in a certain way, 
there is reflection and very clear commentary on the kind of social sciences and the role that they play right from the beginning even before you know even before uh, uh, the kothari commission which you know for a while uh, uh, the indian education commission which was kind of taken as a national education policy the comment on social science in nep 2020 as such is missing and that is one of the first thing that we need to understand but we also need to understand when we are looking at education for democracy what is the kind of society that is envisaged and hoped for and re recognized as in this policy document these bold uh, statements that i have i have the things that i have made into bold please do look at those uh this kind of a uh, statement of an education system rooted in indian ethos that contributes directly to transform in india that is bharat sustainable into an equitable and vibrant knowledge society by providing high quality education to all and thereby making india a global knowledge superpower okay this is the opening i mean not the opening statement but this is a vision of the policy if you break these down there are many loaded kind of conceptions in this statement itself when you talk about the education system rooted in indian ethos yes ancient times onwards india was one of the indian subcontinent rather was one of the uh, uh, cultures in the world that had an established formal education system but what was that system like what was the place of knowledge was it available for all was it available for all sections of society or was it based on the ascribed status of caste was it based on the ascribed uh, accident of birth or gender so if we say that education system rooted in indian ethos which then seems to transform india the bharat sustainably <laughs> into equitable and vibrant knowledge society uh, when we look at the word, word knowledge society that concept itself has emerged out of looking at knowledge as a commodity as something that is a marketable thing and not something that is you know empowering not something that is essential and equitable for all so there are a lot of contradictions that are there in statements like this and when you look at the from the lens of social sciences you need to highlight these contradictions that are there uh, the question that i am raising here is that yes seeking for well being of people uh, providing high quality education to all is essential because we are a democracy and in democracy one of the main tenets of the uh, of the kind of uh, society we have have to has to be equality and so education for all of same good quality is something that can understand but why is it that we are seeking to be knowledge superpower when you look at the concept of knowledge superpower again it is embedded in the concept of knowledge society which comes from you know the management theories essentially management theories which are essential to competitive markets that look at the labor look at resources as dispensable kind of items so if you don't want so many people working in your factory you can do away with them but if you need that kind of a large force you engineer your social decisions your educational policies in order to create that kind of manpower and so is this the kind of i mean this is the kind of vision that is uh, a very it's not stated but this is exactly if you look at the uh, the reflection that is there about these these concepts are not something that are innocent they are very uh, uh, very loaded and there is much work and much commentary about all these concepts again you all the time this kind of refrain about learners pride in being indian not only in thought 
but also in spirit intellect deals and to develop knowledge skills and uh, values and dispositions that support human rights and etc cetera, etc cetera. but again the you know the the issue of what exactly means to be an indian is a contested thing even today as we live much more than it ever was um so there are other uh, uh, insights that we can uh, see in terms of social sciences in nap which is without any direct kind of a statement and here you see that most of the time the emphasis is on creating a certain kind of a workforce of human resource management creating that knowledge society conception okay or knowledge superpower conception so creating a certain kind of a skilled workforce particularly involving mathematics so you know the stem subjects the computer science and data science are the primary kind of a sort after uh, uh, sort after knowledge streams and then um, other branches of science uh, including social science and humanities are supposed to be instrumental in making the understanding in decision making with uh, you know in society as a uh, as a uh, wise decision make making and so it is not something for the ability to engage as a democratic citizen nor as an ability to critically engage with asking fundamental question about the structure of society that you see the role of social sciences but the role of social sciences is seen as something as a tool for a certain kind of decision making in favor of for workforce i mean towards creating a certain kind of a workforce again i've highlighted these some of these things and these you know all the time the refrain of rich heritage heritage uh, of the ancient india uh, and the knowledge that is to be gained here you can see this is in red uh, state a uh, red uh, writing uh, highlight is that the aim of education in ancient india was not just the acquisition of knowledge as preparation for life in the world or life beyond schooling but for the complete realization and liberation of self itself i mean the <laughs> the kind of conception that is there in terms of creating a workforce and then hoping for a liberation you know the moksha or directly very very directly the karma theory so there are conflicting kind of imaginations of society itself at no point while all these great universities and great scholars are mentioned at no point is there any understanding or critique that that kind of a society while it did generate uh, important knowledge it and 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 it had much to kind of share with the world at that point uh, it is was possible at the cost of the majority of the people their labor their enslavement their denial to knowledge and so a certain kind of groups uh, control over knowledge is not something that we recognize when we look at the great indian tradition and culture that is there uh, which is now to be furthered even when curricular integration is sought it is sort i uh, because of lack of time i'm going to kind of wind up wind up soon um, you know so the basically uh, the curricular integration is also kind of sort this is one of the distinctive kind of uh, features of the policy and that is emphasizes on multidisciplinary uh, teaching um, it does not show the evidence of how that is to be done because in school the school pedagogy and system is not to be changed in any way you don't have teachers teaching social science who have knowledge in the discipline of history or geography or political science or economics or teachers in science teaching physics or chemistry or biology at school level there are supposed to be teachers who are not necessarily trained in those disciplines there is no direction or reflection at all in the entire policy giving any insight into how that kind of a thing is going to be possible uh, in terms of creating you know that interdisciplinary kind of an approach uh, and so um, that also needs to be uh, uh, seen as one of the 
questions that needs to be raised. Uh, so um, uh, again, the kind of you know uh, uh, the 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 kind of uh, values and the kind of uh, points that are flagged, like doing what is right, will be given logical framework and ethical decision. But at the same time, in the next paragraph, in the same para, not the next para, in the same paragraph, you have ethical reasoning, which is combined with traditional Indian values. And then you go into human and constitutional values. The constitutional core values are, in fact, at the last end of the bracket. In between, there is a whole, you know, medley of kind of a medley of kind of a things, you know, righteous conduct. Uh, but then you have uh, nishkama karma again. Nishkama karma and criticality can't possibly coexist. And so when you, there is, there is uh, you know, uh, in that sense, no critiquing things blindly for what it is, but one must at least acknowledge, you can't go back and correct what there was, but you certainly, by accepting yourself to be a certain kind of a polity, a democratic polity, based on well-being of all, based on equal rights to all, not simply well-being of all, people's agency, people's right to participate. That is the, if that is the core and that is what social science is, both in terms of understanding and critiquing social, I mean, understanding social phenomena and developing tools to, uh, you know, uh, engage with society, uh, as a scientific discipline, as well as an engaged citizen is supposed to do. Uh, those answers are not available in the NEP. And so the teachers also are imagined not in terms of what their potential can be as transformative uh, demo, uh, in intellectuals, the way Jiro saw, sees, but as, um, you know, uh, uh, ideals that were ideals that were there in the ancient times, the gurus who had the choice to deny uh, education if that person happened to be of the lower caste. Okay, and so uh, there are other uh, insights. I mean, there are other problems also. This is something that I share from higher education also. Is that while multidisciplinary education is uh, sought. Uh, it's essentially, uh, you know, you hardly see the entrance of, you don't see the uh, discipline of history, geography, political science recognized at all. Even in the at higher education, you have only sociology economics. I mean, sociology, you can say, okay, the mother of, you know, social sciences, at least in historical terms, or even economics as a branch that developed uh, much earlier. But these two developed in a certain kind of a condition that was nestled in mercantilism, nestled in imperialism. And so you need to also then investigate as to how do, how do we see it today? How do the policymakers see it today? And so I'll stop here. We then can then have a common discussion about what is it that we see as citizenship, citizen, function of social sciences in anything? Thank you so much, Simantini, ma'am, for this much necessary questions that need to be raised and for the beautiful insight on the same. I would like request my colleague, Ms. Feza Ansari, to take over the QA session. Ms. Feza. Thank you, Niharika. Good evening, everyone. So now it's time to begin with our discussion of Vartala. So anybody from the audience would like to ask any question or comment on something? There was already something on the chat, so if you can take that. Sure. We already have something discussed in our chat box. The one participant said, isn't citizenship about following law of land, agnostic to what different concepts of democracy are? To that, the other participant replied, the law of land may not always be fair to all. Example, farm laws of strong democracy would seek to create citizens who can question the law of land if it is not in their interest. 
Yeah, I'd also like to interject is that when laws are made, those laws are not made, you should see the history of each and every law more or less. The laws are made because there are different interest groups in society that seek to have that certain law. Those interest groups may be silent. They may not be visible to you, but their power is extremely visible because the law is there. So, or, or in cases like say the atrocity act, the act against atrocity against Dalits, for example, is also there because, you know, there has been, uh, or, or the law against rape. I mean, I'm not saying that everything in that law is right. Uh, so particularly the capital punishment part of it, but I'm just saying making law is not a pass passive thing either. To that, Harshid would reply, being a citizen is not a passive act on the very basis that democracy functions better through active participation of its citizens. One can seek change in the laws of the land. To that, somebody replied, thank you, Harshid. I agree citizenship is not passive, but then now how would you define a good citizen for people born in various ge geographies and different law? Are you suggesting evolu evolution to democracy across the world? Uh, I'm not particularly clear about the last comment. No, you don't seek to uh, change the kind of pattern of voting or structure of democracy in the country. What you are looking, looking at, I mean, that also can be investigated. But what you also are looking at in terms of the role of social sciences, particularly the mantle social sciences have of citizenship education, of creating certain kind of citizenry for future. And so that definitely depends on the idea of society and idea of democracy that you have. And that is something which is both stated, stated in something like our constitution, but that doesn't necessarily mean that everything that is stated is, you know, uh, uh, followed or put to practice. So one is not talking about defining democracy and the types of democracy alone, which is a very worthy exercise. One is talking about the kind of engagement with the polity in democracy, the role individuals or collectives are meant to have in a polity like that. And thus the role that education and so social sciences are meant to. Uh, we also have another question in the chat box. As society evolves, isn't that a natural state of haves and have nots? Yes, of course. But do we want to keep that natural state of haves and have nots? And who are those haves and have nots? Are they more or less the same? The kind of groupings that you have of haves and have nots? They do change historically, but there are also groups, you can talk about women. In our context, you talk about caste. In today's independent India, you also talk about Muslims. So is that something, or, or people who have been traditionally, the working caste groups in rural India, the Adivasis in our country, they fall into that category. And there are certain haves that have the cultural capital as well as the socioeconomic capital since 3000 years that have the power. So the point is not about, uh, you know, recognizing that there are haves and have nots. The point is to question as to why those kind of, you know, polarities exist and who, who are there and are we wanting then desirous to kind of reduce the gap between the two reduce it substantially. And who is to do that process of reducing the gap? Is it the welfare state? Is it doing it? Because the nature of welfare state itself has changed. Today, uh, because there was a crisis in Sri Lanka, there is a crisis in Sri Lanka. Some bureaucrats met, met the prime minister last week and said that many states are declaring all sorts of uh, measures like electricity and water and whatever, education and uh, things. 
uh, and so we will also, if we distribute freebies, then we'll also be like Sri Lanka. So the whole notion of welfare state is completely crushed under the carpet. The idea of welfare state was that when people are not able to, uh, you know, are, are not able in a position to have their rights fulfilled, they uh, also need to be supported by the state. It's the state's duty, particularly the right to education. The state is incumbent to you know, provide for the right to education. This is one of the precious rights where the duty is of the, on the state, for example. But we know that's not happening. It's only the poorest people who go to your Zilla Parishad and municipal schools, which we know the kind of quality that is provided for there because the market overrules and the state doesn't intervene in the market. Neither does the NEP intervene in the market, for example. They only talk about regulating fees. They don't talk about, you know, stopping unfair practices. We have another comment in the chat box. Thank you. But constitution treated like a living tree and therefore change is expected. Yes, of course. Yeah. Yeah, but what of that? Change is expected not simply because the constitution is treated like a living tree. Change is also expected because you can't stop change. Change is part of society. It is something that is happens. But I mean, today we have a dispensation which actually, uh, you know, is doing changes in the con constitution without actually changing anything in words. So change is something that you can't stop but you need to at least understand what kind of change is happening and stand with the kind of change that you desire, you're desirous of. And that is exactly the role that social sciences are meant to play. Oh, thank you, thank you, ma'am. So do we have any other question or comment? Good evening. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, Jeshi, ma'am, you want to speak, please. I think some issue with her audio. There's another question uh, here in the chat or comment or a question about, um, you know, women's equal participation and representation. So that uh, women's active participation at political level is less. Yes, of course. And that is also because of the kind of uh, society that we have been and we still are in terms of controlling, uh, you know, controlling social structure, essentially the caste structure or even the religious divide by controlling the agency of girls and women. And so, uh, you know, you kind of, and even in, in the poorest, I mean, on one hand, even in the poorest of the poor families, um, uh, the girls, I mean, you, you might kind of side with those who are marginalized, but even in the marginalized, the girl is the most marginalized in that sense. And so um, unless and until you kind of, uh, you know, uh, change the fundamental kind of a structure in terms of looking at, uh, you know, the 100% agency of women for themselves. And I'm, I mean, particularly the right to their own a choice in terms of their partners, their right, the uh, wish to marry or not marry. Those are the kind of things that also a lot of controls that are there on women really are about their behavior, about their sexual behavior essentially. So whether it is a religion that imposes or the society that critiques and imposes it or whatever. So those are the kind of a lot of battles are fought on the stage of women's rights to their own agency. And so participation of women in all fields in that sense, while there are many of us who have the fortune of not feeling the brunt of it, on the larger level, we know that is not the case for most of the people in our country. And so... As a percentage of world population, where do you think such a society has evolved to a required ideal democracy? No, no, I wasn't in fact proposing
to represent any of those theorizations as anything ideal. In fact, I kept on saying that there is nothing ideal. These are contestations and they must carry on. These kind of debates must carry on in re with regards to how we want to see the democracy is. There is no perfect solution anywhere. So at the same time, it is essential for us to ask questions not towards perfection, but to at least recognize where imperfections are. And there's plenty of that, right? The point about this whole discussion is that that there is this is a this is a this is a very precious thing. The idea of democracy itself is a very important idea. And if we recognize it to be so, let us at least acknowledge how it is that we view our democracy. How are the policies in our country trying to then further those ideas? Are they? If they're not, then what can we do? Jayashree saying, how often are students, teachers- We have some more comments, yes. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Would you, can you read that? Sure, ma'am. So Jayashree says, I realize how, how often our student teacher hardly ever think of citizenship from various perspectives. Alan Sayers writing on democratic imagination talks of similar things you spoke of. So agreed to engage our learning with such critical questions. We have another comment. Tribals are also citizens, but they are not aware of rights. So what should we do to make them aware of their rights? Well, I mean, I don't think tribals are not aware of their rights. Some of the, you know, some of the important key uh, movements uh, that have actually widened the scope of our democracy and made it possible to, uh, you know, better laws in terms of, say, takeover of your land by um, the government for a certain project have been actually fought by tribals, asking questions about what is development, whose development has been raised by, say, for example, the Narmada Bacha Vandula, uh, where, you know, the Sardar Sarovar Dam is being built, or uh, the questions about, you know, mine, mining and uh, environment. These are being raised by the, uh, uh, the tribals fighting in the Orissa mining belt. And so tribals are certainly aware of their rights. Uh, whether I, I definitely do not endorse it, but the Naxal movement that is there is alive because of the tribal support, for example. One of the, some of the, in fact, we should go back in history and try and understand that when the earliest struggles against the British were not only the organized struggles of farmers and you know what we know of the 18. Uh, 57 uh, upri uprising, essentially the battle against the British, but also the struggles that tribals in central I India, tribals in northeast India fought against the Zamindas or the, their Rajas and the Kulaks there who were, uh, you, who were, you know, who were actually uh, indebted to the British and were under the thumb of the British in that sense. And so, um, yeah. So, so. But I, 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 at the same time, I do agree that they do feel disempowered and one of the most disempowered groups because of the, the continuous assault on their resources and their space is the Adivasis of India. Yes. We have one more question in the chat box asking, NEP will be helpful improve our education or not? Can improve village side education because in village they're not aware quality education. Actually, government data itself shows that all across our country, every section of our society, however people are poor, whatever religion and caste they belong to. And this is something from 1990, early 1990 onwards, different studies like, for example, the probe report and later on also, you know, several policy documents show that the enrollment rate in our country and in our schools is almost 100%. The issue is of retention. And if you study the dias data, for example, you know, the number of schools that are available, you don't have schools that provide for education from early childhood to 12th standard, or even I would say 10th standard. Okay. And so it's not people's choice to take their children away from schools. It's the schools that are not there for children. So it is not 
people's not being aware there are studies the nsso studies jandala uh, tilak you should look at particularly has shown us that the amount of money the poorest person spends from the monthly earning is something like 60 to 65% for the children's education you know your rickshaw wala the domestic worker at the cost of even uh, a good square meal and so education is a high priority for the people of india whosoever you are so nep will helpful improve education or not uh that is a question that will need little more discussion but if you ask me honestly uh unfortunately not it is a very serious situation that we will get into if we take the path of what this document seeks to do and it is not only by reading this document and what it states but one also should train oneself to look at what the earlier policy draft document in 2016 said and particularly about things like social science or particularly about you know the spread of education here if you see in fact the number of schools that are there in right to education the ratio of schools that is meant to be there from teacher uh, student ratio is now being curtailed when the sarva shiksha abhiyan began advocacy groups education is intervened to argue for schools that were in yeah, yeah. no knowledge society essentially means dividing society creating society according to different kinds of roles somebody to be a laborer somebody to go into your seattle valley and become uh, you know a ceo of a it company and so knowledge society essentially if you go into the understanding of what knowledge society is that is the understanding of knowledge society which is nestled in spencerian herbert spencerian social darwinist kind of theories which believes in survival of the fittest which believes in exploiting the capital of a certain kind of class for certain things and honing that kind of a system then to fulfill the you know the existence and the privilege of the market over people essentially so if this is the primary understanding that is there in reflected in the nep and so today we have the uh, you know the youngest amount of people that are there the most uh, people most uh, uh, the largest section of people going to education and higher education most numbers in our country similarly the productive population in our country is the highest in the world so we are both a market for uh, education as well as we are a supply for labor of different kind of labor and in a globalized world labor is dispensable so to you saw in covid what was happening it's not something that happens only to people who left their homes from cities and went back to the villages but also thousands of people that were thrown out of their jobs by a striking of a little key of the computer how they were rendered jobless in high paying it jobs also so these are the kind of things that are something that are 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 kind of rationalized and become stated in policy when you reduce the number of schools like as i was talking about earlier you reduce the number of primary schools and arrange them according to cluster schools for example you know reduce the number the, the increase the spread of the uh, catchment area of the primary school you also reduce chances of children who have to cross nalas and tekdis and mountains and highways and uh, you know uh, girls in particular to reach school and so you may have a primary school if it all in in the demographics it's such that in in a, a good number of places there even that privilege is not there but even when there is a pri primary schools the children are guaranteed that they are going to the sixth standard so then what is it if you are actually normatively changing the structure of education against the grain of right to education which itself is a fairly weak legal instrument but further weakening it this is what you will get thank yeah. you very much yeah yeah i think the discussion is i think a never ending discussion and very stimulating actually uh, 
I'm sure participants are quite interested in knowing a lot of things. And this is not the end. This is just a trailer, basically. We can continue these discussions. Uh, we can write to uh, Simanthani, ma'am, for you know any kind of queries, extra, uh, continuing the dialogues, and so on. Uh, thank you, Simanthani, Ms. Simanthani, for sparing your valuable time and really stimulating our thoughts uh, with respect to you know what, what kind of citizen. Basically, it's a very uh, what do you say? The heavy word democracy and citizen and you, you just made it so simple and the understanding was really very easy for each one of us to uh, come up with you know the kind of questions and the doubts that raised in our minds and I'm sure this discussion must continue thank you so much for coming here and stimulating our thoughts thank you participants for coming and uh, you know engaging with the discourse and you know uh, triggering these kind of uh, questions and thoughts to continue forever, basically. And as educators, we need to keep on uh, thinking and discussing this. As uh, uh, Simantini pointed out, it must, you know, these debates should go on. So we should continue these debates. Uh, so as uh, uh, on behalf of the Center of Excellence in Teacher Education, and I, I thank all of you for participating in this discussion series. And we will come again uh, in a month's time with another, uh, you know, interesting discussion, which will probably pertain to the theme of science education. Uh, but yes, uh, with e each and every discussion, it doesn't stop here. Please post your questions. We have a community of practice, uh, the Teaching and Learning Consortium group. If you are a part of the group, please post the questions. If you are not part of the group, please write to us. Uh, we will include you in the group and we can continue with these discussions. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Thanks for. Yeah, thank you so much, Simantani. Yeah.